Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 18th. First up, this is an article. The main subject of this article I've been following for quite a bit of time. It's about people that are having cataract surgery, and there's been an effect lately, especially since Bausch & Lomb has come out with a new implant lens to replace your natural lens for cataracts. It's uh, a lens that some people say has actually given them the ability to see somewhat in the ultraviolet spectrum. And there's an engineer that also has a website called Komar, K-O-M-A-R dot org. His last name is a little bit longer than that, but I'm not going to try to butcher it, so I'm just going to call him Alec. And what he is, since he's an engineer and a photographer by hobby, he's very interested in optics. And if you check out his Komar dot org website, and I'll give you the direct link to it, and you scroll down, you will see as he's going through this cataract surgery, he talks about the different effects to his eyesight um, from the cataracts to the implant. And with hovering the mouse over the pictures, you can actually see approximations of what he is seeing in various stages of going through this. And then he also explains at the end how his effect of being able to see the extra ultraviolet light makes things look to him. He shows an object. I know a lot of people say with uh, certain materials, once they believe they can see the ultraviolet rays, certain materials have a different shine or a shimmer. To him, some materials that look dark and almost black have a deep, ultra, uh, have a deep violet color to them. And so it's kind of cool to see what other people can see. He's even himself used equipment to be able to, to measure the light frequencies in nanometers to be able to see exactly what frequencies he can detect with his eyesight now that he's got this new lens um, compared to what other people normally can. Um, it's kind of cool to have uh, maybe uh, what you would consider enhanced vision. The only thing I would be careful about with this too is obviously then when they built this lens it does not filter out ultraviolet light and normally I'm just wondering since your retina was not originally designed to be able to extend far into the ultraviolet range depending on what wavelengths you are picking up it might be a good idea to talk with your eye doctor about some kind of protection or something like that to attenuate the ultraviolet light because I don't know um, what kind of uh, effects that may be having the long term with your retina and being that it was uh, designed to operate just in the regular color frequencies we see. It's also kind of cool too, he shows a, a black light itself, a, a tube where uh, when you normally see it you see almost nothing, it's just really really darkish purple. He can actually see it as a rather bright light so check it out, scroll down, look at some of the pictures and uh, he gives updates too on this. I've been following it for a while and he's been giving updates on uh, how this has been affecting his vision and uh, overall he's very satisfied with the results now. A lot of us when we get up into the ages of the late 50s, early 60s, it's something we have to be concerned about and I guess the majority of people once they reach 70, that's pretty much cataract surgery is in store for you. This next one is an article from the trucker.com or actually I got this article from the trucker magazine that my son-in-law brought for me. We'd been talking ourselves I think for well over a year about um, trucks switching to some kind of different kind of power and because electric just does not have the right power to weight ratio for trucks it's probably in the next 10 20 years going to be fine for cars motorcycles but trucks need a little bit more energy in the fuel and right now with diesel and the cost of it plus the fact that cleaning up the diesel fuel when you have a liquid refined fuel from oil like that you're always going to have particulate matter and that's the real big challenge now is getting rid of uh, small micron particles in the discharge of the combustion process now. You can do it through engineering, you can add all kinds of filtration units, but then the cost goes up, the maintenance goes up, but with switching to natural gas, which they're talking about doing now, and I guess altogether they're getting close to half a billion dollars in investment from various operations, mostly uh, energy companies themselves, but they're talking about they want to put in 150 stations by the end of 2013 and they're scheduled to be opening 70 stations by the end of 2012. Mostly these are going to be taken up by the Pilot Flying J, which is the world's nation's largest truck stop operator. Uh, there's also one in my area about uh, 12 miles to the west, so maybe if I get a chance I can get out there this summer and see if they're going to hook into the natural gas thing. Our, Illinois is one of the states that's targeted along with Missouri, Indiana, and Ohio. The article tells you the other states and the other corridor they want to um, get taken care of is San Diego, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and then to the um, Texas Triangle, Houston, and the other areas around there. So there'll be two areas of the country that are probably going to be the first to see these natural gas stations. It'll be uh, liquid natural gas, and there'll be 
uh, special connections, I'm sure the truck drivers being CDL licensed drivers will be able to easily be retrained to be able to use the new connectors to be able to haul around uh, liquid natural gas in the trucks. And because it vaporizes into gas naturally, it should be a lot cleaner burning. They said about 23% less emissions and the cost still somewhere in the range of about 40% cost savings just because of the fact in North America, Canada and the United States, we for now have an abundance of natural gas and they said even though they've backed off on exploring for natural gas because there's such an abundance and the price is so low as they explore for oil they hit more and more natural gas pockets so I guess for quite some time to come that may be the way that we're going to go for uh, trucks and it's also nice just to be uh, more energy independent too at least the money we pay for the fuel stays in North America so I do like that part. As you know I've been talking about um, fighting for a free unencumbered internet for those of us that uh, don't like governments or corporations telling us uh, what to do online. Well, this latest issue, the March issue of Scientific American, has a great article called Internet Freedom Fighters Build a Shadow Web. The subtitle is Governments and Corporations Have More Control Over the Internet Than Ever. Now digital activists want to build an alternative network that can never be blocked, filtered, or shut down. The basic idea of this is a mesh network. It's where you get just a group of people that instead of your internet connection being an endpoint, what happens is your internet connection can also be a relay point. Uh, it's somewhat like the same principle that you do in torrents too. Not only are you receiving information, but you're rebroadcasting it. But this one is kind of neat because it was thinking of the same thing I was thinking of too, a little broadcast station up on the roof of your house or your building. In fact, they call this Linksys router in a Tupperware box. And they've actually, if you read this article, there are, there are areas uh, around the world where they've actually set up these mesh networks. And it seems once you get a local area that has about 30 to 40 of them going, they're pretty robust. And if you lose some connections, it doesn't matter. It just works its way around the connections and information still gets through. Um, I'm sure once you reach the point of several hundred to several thousand, it's almost impossible to shut it down. I mean, basically, if a government or a corporate entity wanted to try to shut down that Internet, they'd basically have to track down every single one of them. Whereas now, with users mostly being endpoints, you have situations like uh, in the Middle East where you've had countries just by calling up three or four different phone numbers, they shut, out, they shut down all the ISPs going into the country, and basically communications between everybody is shut off. Well, with this kind of mesh network... Uh, it just isn't going to be practically able to be done. I mean, there's just everybody is a communication network, so even if they do um, shut a lot of the outgoing things to other countries, still within the country itself, you're going to be able to communicate. And uh, all, all it would take, too, I mean, suppose you have several hundred, you're going to have a few people that are going to want to set up a satellite dish and shoot up to the satellites, so you will probably still have a way, once these mesh networks get going pretty good, you'll still have a way to be able to get outside your country and uh, log on. Um, maybe not always at the best of speeds, but the main thing is just getting the information out and not being encumbered by uh, government or corporate control. So anyway, those are the articles I have right now. As usual, all of them, the links will be down in the descriptions. Um, the trucker is, uh, I'm going to give a link to that, not the trucker. Well, the trucker um, does have its own .com website, but it is horrible to use. So they have, uh, I've got an alternative link here to uh, a page that is probably supplied for mobile, uh, mobile devices and smartphones, which is uh, a little bit easier to navigate. And so I will put that down as the link to the uh, natural, the new natural gas highway they're going to be creating starting this year. So that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.